We're in this very interesting moment where it looks like general purpose robotics for many different applications is about to tip over. Like, you know, in the next few years, it's going to tip over and start to really happen. And then there's a software side of the problem, which we're ahead on, but there's a hardware side of the problem where China has a major, major lead. It's the entire supply chain. So this is this is where it gets very dangerous because um, there are many parts in these things and they're all coming from China right now. But we're doing nothing in the U.S. In the very best case, we're going to have a dependency on a friend and in the worst case, a dependency on an enemy. So Ben, uh, robotics. So yeah, actually, why, why don't we start? Actually, uh, if, if, if you're okay with it, why don't we actually start with you? Like, what what what's your assessment for kind of what's happening in robotics, specifically like advances in AI over the over the last five years and advances in software? Like, what what's what's your read on basically what's happening with robotics? And then I'll and then I'll fill in. Yeah, so I think on the software side, um, you, you know, we're in a very interesting place, and in be, because we now have, um, you know, AI that 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 can really learn, um, as as we've seen, and can learn all kinds of stuff. Um, and if you think about robotics historically, it's been, you know, the applications have been limited uh, because. Um, the robots are, I, I would say, extremely rigid. So uh, when they're programmed, like for example, at uh, General Motors, when they're programmed to make a car, um, you know, they're, they're very big machines um, and, you know, they're gonna like put a bolt on something, um, but like, or, a, a, you know, screw a nut on a bolt or, you know, hammer something in or what have you. Um, but if that thing is off by like two millimeters, um, you know, it could put a hole through a wall or if there's a person in the way, it could like slam the human. Um, and then they have to be like very carefully programmed for each task. Whereas, you know, in an AI world, you could imagine just demonstrating um, to the robot how to do something and then it would learn it and it would learn it more flexibly because it would understand, look, I just want the nut on the bolt. I don't care. <laughs> Like, you know, that, you know, that you're a millimeter over here, a millimeter over there. I just want the nut on the ball, figure out how to do it. Um, the current models uh, are a little, uh, you know, kind of, they're not totally generalizable. They're getting very, very good. And um, you can talk about uh, robot dogs and so forth. Uh, but there's a kind of new wave of models coming um, there, there's a few companies. One is uh, World Labs, um, founded by Fei Fei Li, the great computer science professor. And another is, um, you know, XAI, uh, run by Elon, who are both like looking at, okay, how does a real world model? What about a model that doesn't just understand language or images, um, but understands the actual underlying physics and these kinds of things, um, which could be like very very interesting um, for doing more advanced robotic tasks. And so there's a lot of work on the software side that looks like it will kind of bring us to the age of robotics. And then if you combine that with the fact that, okay, these robots can like see and speak English, <laughs> um, so they're very easy to instruct and so on, you can imagine all kinds of applications for them. And so um, we're at like a really, I would say important part on um, the software side over the next five years, where all kinds of things are going to be possible that haven't been today. And then, of course, we've seen, um, you know, this also, it's it's very, very important geopolitically because the kind of next generation of weapons um, and, uh, you know, drones and autonomous aircraft, autonomous submarines and so forth are all kinds of some kind of robot. And then, you know, I'm sure we'll have autonomous soldiers and all that kind of thing as well. So the the good news, I think, Ben, of everything that you described is like America, specifically the U.S., is like leading on this on the software here, right? So a lot of what we're talking about here, and maybe even everything you just talked about, is primarily yep. in the U.S. or mostly in the U.S. or or you know some in, a little bit maybe in, in the U.K. Um, but mostly here. Um, and so you know the, the U.S. West free world is you know is 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 out ahead on this on the software side, which is good, um, which is really important, um, both economically and as Ben said, kind of strategically, militarily. Um, the hardware side, I'm I'm starting to get worried about. Um, and so here's my concern of what's happening on the hardware side. And this is <laughs> a good thing to be worried about, by the way. 
Yes. So this and this gets straight into like every basically big issue right now around, you know, basically international relations, geopolitics, um, you know, all the if, a fair number of issues actually in the in the current political landscape around things like industrial policy. So so basically, like, here's my read on what's happening, which is um, so 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 if you go back in time, basically what happens is when, when whenever there's like basically a complex physical thing to get built. And let's just use the canonical example of this being the automobile. Um, you don't just have a car company. What you have is you have an entire ecosystem of, of parts. Um, and you, and you could even say there's like actually two kinds of parts. There's the, there's actually the parts for building the parts. And so there's like the, the machines for building the machines. Right. Um, so, you know, the, the machines for like crafting, like all the car parts. Um, and then there's all the car parts themselves. Um, and you know, it's every, 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 everything involved, the sheet metal and the carburetors and the engines and, 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 and everything else. And, you know, and, and, and obviously like as cars got very complex as the, you know, technological internals of cars got very complex, the supply chain for cars got very complex. And so the, a, a car that you buy today has parts in it from, I don't even know, you know, hundreds and hundreds of, of, of upstream, you know, suppliers of, of, of components. Um, if you look at basically how the auto industry works, you know, that, that's basically how it works is the cars are basically assembled out of all these parts. Um, there's an ecosystem of basically parts, um, for making cars in Detroit. Um, there's an ecosystem in Germany, there's an ecosystem in Japan. Um, and, and this is important because it means that it's not just the car company. It means it's like, there's like a thousand other companies that are right behind the car company. Um, and basically if you like have those thousand other companies, you can have a car industry. And if you don't have those thousand other companies, you can't have a car industry. Yeah. Um, and so this, this was really key to the development of the American auto industry. G Germany built the exact same thing. And in fact, Germany kind of famously has this thing. I think I'll get the, hopefully the pronunciation right. Mittelstadt, which is sort of, they have this, like basically this archipelago of thousands of small, basically mid-size, uh, manufacturing companies, by the way, most of them family held that are, are basically like world-class at building like all the specific componentry. Uh, they go, you know, and German cars are like fantastically high quality. And so when you buy a Mercedes or BMW, it's basically made up of parts from all these thousands of, of, of mid-sized specialist companies. Yeah. Um, and this is, you know, and, and, and by the way, that, you know, in Germany, in, you know, American car industry is important for America, but in Germany, the car industry is like very important to the economy. Um, it's like a <laughs> yeah, large, it's like the whole economy or not it's a very huge, huge percentage of G. It's a huge percentage. And, and, uh, you know, VW is, you know, is it, like the, 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 you know, percent, I don't know if for exactly the number, but like a very large percentage of people in Germany either work for, you know, work for the car, car industry or work or, or have family members who do, um, or, and or so the it, supply it's, chain. Yeah or the supply chain behind it. Um, um, and then, and then Japan, you know, Japan is, as Japan came up in cars in the sixties and seventies and eighties, they, they did, they did a similar thing. And so, um, and by the way, I should also say the presumption is in a world of like, you know, completely free trade, right. You could have the parts, you know, suppliers anywhere. Um, cause you could just buy parts from, you know, from, from anywhere, you know, that assumes number one, that you have a world of like completely liquid free trade, which is, you know, always difficult under any, under, by the way, under any gov modern government of any kind. Um, you know, the, you know, we, 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 we were far from free trade, um, and it basically every presidential, you know, regime in our lifetimes. Um, and then by the way, it also assumes that there's no geopolitical conflict, right? Because like, you know, if, if you get into like a war with somebody, you're going to like stop selling, you know, parts to them. Um, and so, you know, there, this gets into the issue, you know, sort of economic nationalism issues, which is like, okay, you know, can you, can, you know, can you, if you, if you have a car company in country X and if they can't get access to foreign parts, can they build the car? Yeah. Um, and, oh, and then this is actually really important. So built objects like cars, um, you cannot make a car if you do not have 100% of the parts. Yeah. Right. And so, right. And so if there's a thousand parts that go into a car and you have 999 of them, <laughs> you can't make a car. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Right. You are done, right? You yeah. are done. And and what happens with the car companies, for example, is when they can't make cars, they start burning cash like crazy. Oh, and yeah. They're on a, yeah. There because of all their fixed costs, and so they are, and they can't make cars, and so they are on a fuse to bankruptcy, like in a hurry. Yep. Um, and so, and this goes to this idea of supply chain fragility, which is like if you can't get parts, like this is a problem. And by the way, we saw this during COVID because there were supply chain disruptions, and the American automakers actually had to stop making cars for a while, yep. um, and things actually got quite dicey because they couldn't get all the parts. Get so glass and things like that, yeah. Yeah. And that, that, and that, you know, wasn't, that wasn't, you know, that was, that was a pandemic, not a war, right? Um, you know, so imagine what would happen in a war. Um, <laughs> it's a lot of leverage. Oh. A lot of leverage. Um, uh, okay. So, um, okay. So that's like the historical basis for all this. And then basically, if you look at what's happened specifically, I'm going to uh, hone in on three areas of sort of advanced technology, uh, physical built objects that I, I, I'm very focused on. Um, the first one is drones. 
Um, and so basically what happened is, you know, the, a lot of drone technology was invented in the United States. Um, basically what happened was China, you know, picked it up, developed some of their own, and then created this national champion company called DJI, um, that is, you know, by far the largest drone company. And one of the interesting things about that is the D DJI, DJ, DJI basically itself, and then in its sort of situated location in China, it's not just a drone, it's the entire supply chain of parts that go into making drones. Um, and, and you know, China has had this phenomenon they've been building up for the last, you know, I don't know, 30 years or something, which is called the Shenzhen region, which is where they've got basically their equivalent of that German middle shot thing. They've got like this, this they built up this big ecosystem of basically parts makers for all these kinds, you know, for, for all these things. But, you know, they make a lot of parts for phones and other things, but they make a lot of a lot of parts for drones. Um and then, you know, here in the U.S., we had, you know, <laughs> we had, you know, the FAA basically, you know, make American drones, you know, essentially illegal, um, you know, by, by you know, requiring, what was it, requiring pilot licenses uh, for to, to operate drones. Um, and then, you know, in, and then I should also say, I'll come back to this, but in the U.S., like, it, it is nearly illegal to create a new manufacturing company in the U.S. Uh, for a wide variety of reasons. And and by the way, if if you try, you come under incredible levels of attacks, which we'll, we, we can also talk about. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, you know. Uh, Elon Musk has been going through that, getting sued, you know, multiple times by the Department of Justice, by the state of California, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. So Elon committed the enormous sin of creating a new American manufacturing dynamo of a company. In the <laughs> yeah, of, yeah, that's of, the worst thing you can do. Of Tesla. <laughs> he employs, you know, many, 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 I don't know, hundred at this point, I don't know, it was Tesla now, about what, hundreds of thousands of manufacturing workers in yeah, the U.S.? Yeah, probably so, yeah. Um, and and, and by know, the way, the, the, the best paid, um, manufacturing workers in the world because they have yeah. Tesla and SpaceX stock and so forth. Yeah. Stock. And yeah, a fair number of like manufacturing workers at Tesla are millionaires mm -hmm. now as a consequence of the stock. And, you know, there's a certain class of politician that just absolutely hates him for doing this. Yeah. Um, and the state of and California. Elizabeth Warren. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, and our own, a lot of our own California politicians. Yeah. Um, and so, and he actually basically got chased out of California by these politicians. He's been repeatedly sued. He's been, you know, basically complete, you know, just like, it's just, I, I, I could go on for hours on this, but it's just say, this is not easy, right? It is not easy for somebody to do, to, to, just like build it. <laughs> like, like every time you see a politician talk in public, they talk about how they want to create middle-class jobs and working class jobs and yeah, you know, good and good manufacturing jobs. And then, you know, when it happens, you just come under this withering assault. Um, and then the other problem in the U.S. is, you know, you can't build, you generally can't build factories anyway, because you can't get through environmental review. Um, and, um, you know, you can't, um, you know, you just like, you're not allowed to. And then, you know, the government has these programs like the CHIPS Act that are supposed to encourage like the building of chip factories in the U.S. And then they don't get built because they attach every other political hobby horse issue to, issue to them. Um, and so um, uh, it's just like this, you know, we have this kind of just generalized nightmare scenario in the U.S. in terms of, of, of building manufacturing. But China doesn't. <laughs> China China has like, you know, this Chinese government, this, this is something the Chinese government wants to happen. So they have fostered this. DJI, DJI is the world beating drone company today. They're, I don't know, 90 percent or something of, of drones. There are excellent American drone companies, including some of our companies that we, we would certainly argue have better technology. Uh, and, you know, we, we have high hopes for um, and, you know, uh, are doing are doing well. But like DJI is this like has become this global monster. Um, uh, and again, it's, it's, it's DJI and then it's the entire supply chain of parts that go into it in China. Um, consequence of that is DJI is the most widely used drone today by many, many large, you know, American customers, including the United States Department of Defense. Um, right. The DOD's primary drone supplier is DJI. They, 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 they never, by the way, that's not by design. They didn't decide they wanted that. It's just, it's the easy drone to buy. Yeah. So if you're a squad leader of a soldier on the battlefield and you needed a drone to look over the next hill, this is the drone you buy and you put in your backpack. Um, yeah. and, um, so as a consequence, there's, you know, I don't know what the number is, but at this point, it has to be hundreds of thousands or millions of, of Chinese drones being used by the American military, which is just like such a catastrophically bad idea. Um, <laughs> yep. It, it's hard to even wrap your head around it, uh, right? Because every single one of those drones is a potential surveillance platform by the Chinese Communist Party and a potential weapon, um, <laughs> yeah. right? To be subverted and used in, you know, if there's ever a war, you know, if we go to war with China over Taiwan or something crazy like that, like these drones could all become weapons that are used against our own soldiers. Um, oh yeah. So, well, and then you know yeah. they're they're getting to play in a lot of public safety applications in the U.S. with you know police forces and so forth. I mean, we uh, of course support a better drone uh, from a company called Skydio, um, but many many people are buying the DJI drones for public safety, and you could imagine that could quickly be turned on us. Yeah. So, you know, these drones basically could say, you know, I mean, these drones at scale could disable a city, right? They could, yeah. they, they could, you know, they could, if they go rogue, if they get, you know, if the CCP were to weaponize them, mm -hmm. you know, they could drive everybody indoors. They Just from an intelligence standpoint, you know, you got yeah. drones flying all over the place, you know, filming and uh, sending that signal back to the Chinese government. 
in a war yeah. scenario would be quite dangerous. Quite dangerous. Um, and so, you know, this is this is generally a nightmare scenario. Yes, yeah, so this is like a nightmare scenario. This is a nightmare scenario on multiple fronts. Um, and then it's a, look, it's a nightmare scenario, you know, economically, because it's just like, all right, like, you know, if we can't have a, 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 a equal, you know, the thousands of like manufacturing companies building the parts here, and if we can't have the scale thing, and you know, if we can't even like have it, you know, drone, drone, American drone companies be able to legally fly drones in the U.S. Uh, because of the FAA, then um, you know, then it's just we're just by, by default, you know, handing victory to China with all the consequences that are that are downstream of that. So that was sort of step one. I mean, that's that's the one where you know China's you know done a lot of things over the last 30, 40 years, but this is the one where I'm just like, all right, this is a real problem, um, and you know, we can't let this happen again. And then of course it's about to happen again. Um, and so the second category is happening in is cars. Um, and basically China is following the exact same trajectory that Germany, Japan, and Korea, um, uh, did before it, which is it, you know, there've been domestic Chinese car companies for a long time now, but, you know, generally they've been building cars that are substandard in quality from an American perspective or Western European perspective, generally not actually allowed, you know, because of safety issues to, to be sold into like the American market. Um, and by the way, that's how the Japanese started. That's how the Koreans started. Um, and you know, what happened was the Japanese and Koreans climbed the curve. They got good at it. Um, and they started building really good cars and they started having really good car companies. And, you know, I was, I was a kid in the Midwest in the seventies and eighties when the, the Japanese really invaded and the, 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 the there was tremendous anguish on the part of the uh, American government and the American population and the media about the collapse of the American auto industry and the rise of the Japanese, you know, car makers, um, I, like, I think in the town I grew up in, I think if you had driven a Japanese car, I think it would have been firebombed. Um, like it was, there was like a very high level, <laughs> very high level of an animosity. Well, cause we we're adjacent to Michigan. Yeah. <laughs> um, and this was like a huge and very potent political It, it wasn't that time. way in California, but it, it definitely yes. was that way in Wisconsin. Yeah. Well, in California, of course, you know, you, you know, you know, yeah, uh, if you grew up where Ben grew up in Berkeley, you hate America. So, you know, <laughs> you, 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 if, of course you, you love, you love Japanese cars. Um, Fair. If you, if you grew up in Wisconsin, you love America. And so you uh, actually, it was, you, in a way, it was the opposite in Berkeley. It, it was, uh, you know, now that I think about it, like one American cars were rare and then you were definitely mm -hmm. frowned upon for driving one. Yeah, exactly. See, of course. So anyway, but but, but like, look, it, it worked. And, and the, the brutal truth, the brutal truth of it was um, and there's there's uh, there's a great book. Actually, David Halberstam wrote a great book called The Reckoning, where he he uh, actually told the story. It's a really good book. Um, the, the, the brutal truth of it was the Japanese cars got better. Yeah. Like they, they just, they just got better. By the way, the Korean cars got really, really good. They're, you know, they're really good today. Hyundai and Kia and so yeah. forth are like really good cars now. Um, you know, fully modern state of the art, like every bit as good as anything else. Um, and, um, and obviously the German cars got, you know, to be incredibly good. Um, and so, you know, they got really good. And so, you know, and at some point there's consumer choice and, you know, people want to buy the car they want to buy. And, you know, from a consumer welfare standpoint, if there's a better car available and, you know, maybe with better technology at a cheaper price, you know, your Americans are better off buying that. So it's hard to maintain, you know, it's it's hard to just like blockade these things. You you you, you know, you do kind of want the market to work. Um, you know, but the American car companies got like completely. I mean, they had a whole bunch of issues, and this is a whole other topic. Um, but um, you know, they ended up with a whole bunch of issues. Part of it was they were an oligopoly, so there there was no you know innovation. They had a captive market for too long. Part of it was technological change happened that they didn't stay in front of. Um, part of it was regulations change. There are a whole bunch of reasons why the American car companies caved in in the seventies and eighties. They had to get bailed out the first time. <laughs> Um, 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 but, um, uh, you know, it, it was, it was, it was a, it was a giant problem then. Um, and you know, this continues to be a big source of political tension. Um, but like it, it happened. And so basically what's happening is China's following that path. Um, but China's doing it basically down what China's doing with the Chinese cars is they're doing it downstream of the cell phone supply chain and of the drone supply chain. Um, and so what China has now is not just really good car companies, but they've got this entire constellation of supply chain componentry, these thousands of other companies right behind them and in, in, in the same ecosystem. And, and, and you can see this, if you, you the easiest thing here is just go on YouTube and look for video reviews of the new, uh, Xiaomi, uh, car. So mm -hmm. Xiaomi is one of the big Chinese makers of smartphones. Uh, they now have a car, um, and it's like sort of the equivalent of a Porsche Cayenne, uh, SUV. Um, but it's like $20,000 and it's really good. <laughs> And it's just crystal clear in the reviews. You just read the reviews and or you watch the reviews and it's crystal clear how good the thing is, right? And so uh, as you give when you go to other countries, yeah. like everybody is driving me, like in Mexico, I, you know, it's just been all around the world in Mexico and the Middle East and so forth. They love these Chinese cars. They, they like them better than their Porsche Cayenne. So you and I actually, yeah. that's exactly right. And in fact, yeah. you, you and I just met with a guy who's one of the most successful guys in Dubai. Yes. <laughs> and and uh, what and what did he tell us? Yeah, no, he's, he, he loves his Chinese cars. Like he loves cars, but he's like, I, he, that's the one he, he drives. Yeah. 
So he replaced. He told us. I mean, he this, told ben this guy, me, by the way, is uh, extremely rich. <laughs> he extremely can have rich. any car he wants. Yes, one hundred percent. Um, uh, when this guy meets with you, the buildings that he, these, these, the, the towers that he has built are in the backdrop of the, like <laughs> out, out, out the window. Like this is one of those guys. Yeah. Um, a wonderful and, person um, as well. yeah. a very, very wonderful person. And he told us he literally has replaced his entire personal fleet of cars has been replaced by Chinese cars, not because they're cheaper, but because they're better. Yeah. Um, and you know, Ben and I, you know, our, our, our eyes snapped open so big at that comment, you know, the size yeah. of din dinner plates. Um, and, and by the way, these cars are like the Chinese cars are super technologically sophisticated. And so, like for example, they've got this feature where you just come in and you just drop your phone down on the on the basically on the on the, on the center divider, and basically the car lights up, and, and basically the 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 whole system inside the car becomes you know it comes off your phone, right? So like all your music and your maps and your calendar and like all that stuff is just like automatically there. And then there, there's uh, the new version of the car. Uh, they have a thing where it actually like gets excited when it sees you, and it like does all of these like incredible customized dancing animations with its uh, LED headlights <laughs> yeah. to 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 like you know show how excited it is. It's, like so, it's just and it, but it's like that for everything in the car. It's just like tremendously sophisticated, yeah. you know, fully computerized, you know, electric self driving, like all these things, um, right? Um, and so again, it's this thing where there's this there's this and there's this whole supply chain behind it. And so the both the both the U.S. and the Europeans already are like slapping big import duties on these cars to try to prevent them from coming in. Um, and you know, who knows that may, that may, that may block them for a bit, but like the truth is like, they're really good. Um, yeah. and the truth is like, you know, Americans, Americans ought to be able to buy a car that costs $20,000 and is that good. Um, and of course it'd be great if they could buy it from an American company, but if they can't, they should be able to buy it from a Chinese company. So it's, it, you know, that, that, you know, history shows those kinds of barriers don't, don't last forever. Yeah. Like at some point, you know, we, 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 if, if we don't want to just like lose the auto industry, like at some point we have to do this in the U S uh, by the way, the guy who you know has the highest odds of fighting off the Chinese, you know, the Chinese and the U.S. auto market is, of course, you know, Elon. Yeah, he's being <laughs> tortured to death by his own government. Yeah. By his own government. So that is yet another in a long, long, long list of uh, just kind of crazy ironies happening right now. Um, okay, but this takes us to number three, which is robotics. Um, and I, th this is sort of the the the, the thing that I, I I'm really starting to get worried about. So. Um, you know, everybody has probably seen at this point, you've seen videos of, you know, advanced, you know, kind of personal robotics. And so the classic video that goes around is the, this company, Boston Dynamics, that has been working on, you know, these sort of smart, you know, personal robots for, you know, I don't know, 30 years or something. Um, and they're kind of most famous for the robot dog. And so you've seen all these videos of the robot dog that does backflips and climbs stairs and does all this stuff. Um, and then, you know, there's all these humanoid robots. And, and by the way, you know, Elon just demonstrated the Optimus humanoid robot at his thing. And there's other, you know, there's a bunch of startups doing humanoid robots in the U.S., you know, that look very promising. Um, but there, you know, there's also the humanoid robots coming. And so, um, um, uh, okay, but like th these have been like things that you can like see videos of or see demos of, but these have not been like products that you would buy. They haven't been products that you would buy for two reasons. One is the software wasn't ready yet, which is what, what Ben just talked about, which we think is about to change. So we, we, we like, we think this may be the turning point for that. But the other is they've just been too expensive. Um, and it's just the classic thing, which is the Boston Dynamics robot dog. They're not yet manufacturing them at scale. They don't have a whole supply chain behind them. And so as a consequence, I don't even know if they have a list price because that company doesn't really ship product in the way that yeah. companies I mean, do. I mean, but... it would be like 50 grand though. Yeah, I think it's on the order of $50,000. Like, I don't think you can buy an American robot dog for less than $50,000. Um, my nine-year-old's favorite toy slash companion right now is a $1,500 robot dog from China, from a company called Unitree. Uh, so $50,000 to $1,500. Um, and it basically is the Boston Dynamics robot dog. It is, by the way, it is so clearly like, like the Boston Dynamics robot dog that it really, you know, puts your eyebrows up wondering <laughs> <laughs> where they get the tech. Where do they get the tech? But um, it is the it is equivalent to the Boston Dynamics robot dog. Again, you can go on YouTube and see videos of this thing. And then I I I, I now own I now own one, and I can tell you like this thing. It does it does the videos are real. Um, so it does what's in the video. The thing is real. You can buy it online. They'll ship it to you. Um, and um, it you charge it up, and it has an it has an, a phone app, and you're off to the races. Uh, but this thing is a it's an autonomous self you know con, uh, uh, guiding robot dog. Um, it um, has a uh, light. It has a full sensor suite, including lidar, um, which is the light based radar, um, which historically has been the expensive component that's kept the price of things like this out of reach. But it, it has full 360 degree lidar. Um, uh, which is amazing. Um, and and by the way, you can see it in the in the in the app. You can actually see a full 360. You can see, but it does have 360 video and it has 360 full depth sensing. Um, and so you know, like like us, like like for example, the Waymo self-driving cars, like it really knows what's going on in its environment. 
um, it can, it can, it can, it can run, um, it can climb stairs, it can do flips, um, it can dance, um, it's hooked up to an LLM, it can talk, um, it can teach you quantum physics, um, <laughs> it will follow you, um, it's, you know, it will run autonomous. Um, they have a version, by the way, that's, that's on wheels, um, that will go like 30 miles an hour. <laughs> that is fast. Um, and, and by the way, it's very, it's very compelling. It, it, it can, it, it, on, 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 on flat ground, it, it goes on the wheels and then, but if it needs to like climb stairs, it just locks the wheels and then it's back to being able to climb stairs and being able to walk on uneven surfaces. And so like, it's, it's completely, it's completely flexible. And then that company is also building the humanoids. Um, and the, the price point in those, I think it's on the order of $20,000 and up. Um, but you know, we'll see, we'll see where the, and you know, then these are, by the way, these are like five feet, you know, these are like sizable you know, kind of sizable things. And you can see the videos they, they, and they're making like incredible advances in the, in the, um, you know, in, in the technology very quickly. Um, so like this is starting to happen. And again, the concern here is it's not just that there's one robot company or even that there's going to be a dozen robot companies like this in China. It's that there's a, this entire ecosystem, this entire supply chain behind that. Um, and like in the U S like, you know, and we'll, we'll see what Elon's able to do and we'll see what these other startups are able to do. But like that, 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 that kind of eco, that kind of supply chain ecosystem for this kind of product just doesn't exist in the U S or, or in Europe, by the way. Yeah. Right. Or in Europe. Right. Yeah. The Germans are in no way adapting or at least not yet have not adapted to this. And then there's no place else. Yeah. That would have anything remotely similar to this. Um, and so we're, we're, we're in this, Ben, going back to where we started, we're in this very interesting moment where it looks like general purpose robotics for many different applications is about to tip over. Like, you know, in the next few years, it's going to yep. tip over and start to really happen. And then there's a software side of the problem, which we're ahead on, but there's a hardware side of the problem where China has a major, major lead. Well, and and I, when you say hardware, it's the entire supply chain. So this is, this is where it gets very dangerous because, um, there are many parts in these things and, and they all are. Um, they are all coming from China right now. Yeah, um, that's right. We're, and we're hoping like Japan will heat up um, and start to yeah. make some robot stuff. You know, they they have a good history with robots, um, but we're doing nothing in the U.S. So we're in the very best case, we're going to have a dependency on a friend, and in the worst case, a dependency on an enemy. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. Um, and so, yeah, this goes right back to, okay, why can't this happen in the U.S.? And, you know, there's a combination of issues here. There, but, and by the way, look, there's a, there's a cost there's a cost issue, at least historically, a lot of the reasons why the sort of factories are building all these kinds of parts went to China was because of the cost. Um, but that's not the only reason. It's also because, as we, as we discussed, it's like actually quite brutally difficult to build um, these kinds of companies um, actually in the U.S. and actually make things. Um, and so there's a, like a real, um, yeah. And then it, you mentioned this earlier, but yeah, look, I mean, this is all, you know, there, there, there are, you know, a lot of, a lot of this, you know, the, the robot dog is just fun to play with, but like there are obvious law enforcement um, applications for this technology. There's obvious military applications. Yep. Um, and so, um, you know, this, this, this is going to be a, you know, strategic, this, this kind of thing is going to be a strategic linchpin because like, it's the same supply chain that you use to do the, the robot dog for the nine-year-old. It's that same supply chain that go, would go into making the robot soldier. Yep. Um, right. Or, or, or by the way, the weaponized, uh, you know, military drone, um, or, or, or defense or the, or the defensive drone. Um, right. Um, and so, you know, or the robot guard, right. Um, or, the, you know, so, um, yeah, so th 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 this is a big thing. And, and, you know, this, I, I guess I would say like, you know, I think people in Washington, we talked to our, you know, kind of, you know, learning about this, starting to wrap their head around it. Um, it, you know, this directly cross cuts into, you know, a whole bunch of major policy issues. So one is just environmental, you know, in the U S like, can you build things or do you get blocked with environmental approvals? Um, you know, another, by the way, another, this goes into is energy and cost of energy because energy is a key input to doing all this. And like, is you know, one of the, well, one, actually, this is important. Um, Germany is currently deindustrializing. They're actually going backwards. They're actually shutting factories down. And the reason they're shutting factories down is because energy is too expensive. Well, like they shut down all their nuclear power. They shut down their nuclear power, and then they got you know, dependent on Russian energy. Um, yeah. And now they're hung up. Um, and so the manufacturing plants in Germany are actually being shut down. Not, it's even worse than not being built. They're being shut down. Yeah. And so, you know, how how expensive do we want energy to be? So it gets into that policy. It, by the way, this also gets into labor policy. One of the reasons Elon comes under so much fire for his manufacturing businesses is he refuses to have them be unionized. Um, that means large sectors of the political system, you know, hate him for that, uh, and want to put just endless pressure on him that like the most important thing in the world is to get them to be unionized. Yeah. Um, you know, do, do all these new factories also need to be unionized? Um, then there's the question like with the chips act of government money, which is well, the government unionization is very tricky in the modern world, uh, because of what you referred to earlier, which is, um, you know, kind of cost of labor 
which the way around that for America is highly automated factories, which are almost impossible to build if you have union labor. And so you, you get into this very tricky global competitiveness issue if you're forced down that, that road, which is, um, you know, most of the kind of issues that he's run into have been based on the fact that he is, you know, a modern manufacturing facility that's highly automated. And that yeah, that's is right. why California in particular has been, uh, you know, basically kicked him out of the state. Yep, that's right. Um, and l- let's actually let's. There's actually a recent thing in the news that's a, a case study of this. So the 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 longshoreman uh, strike that just happened in the U.S. for uh, the people who work on docks. Um, you know, which is a, a, a very difficult job, and you know those people are great people. Um, but they're you know they just they, there was a you know their leadership put them on strike recently. Um, renegotiate their terms of their employment. Um, if you go to to Ben's point, if you go to a Chinese modern Chinese dock or like a Chinese built dock in Africa or basically any place new, um, what you see is like fully automated docks, and you see you know docks where you know containers are, are loaded, unloaded, you know very quickly, very cheaply. Um, it's therefore you know very easy to import and export things. It's very easy to like bring in parts from other places. It's very easy to send you know goods goods out for for export. Um, you go to American docks and it's just like much more manually labor intensive and therefore slower. And, and by the way, dangerous um, because, um, you know, it's, it's the very know, dangerous jobs. And, and by the way, not just dangerous in terms of death, but like injury is incredibly dangerous. Yeah, exactly. And so one of the things that was so striking about the <laughs> striking about the strike, one of the things that was so amazing about the dock worker strike is not only did they want to raise, which fair enough, um, but they wanted to basically bans on additional automation. Um, so they wanted to basically lock in the current employment model, uh, forever. And, and, and at first, my, my first reaction to that was, you know, wow, you know that, okay, that sounds, you know, that sounds, you know, that sounds like kind of what you'd expect in this case. And then it actually turned out after the strike, what I learned was actually, um, uh, it's actually really interesting. Uh, 25,000 dock workers work on the docks, um, in the union. Um, but 50,000 dock workers went on strike. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, they, yes, yes. Because it turns out that in prior bargaining agreements, in prior you know time periods, um, there had been a similar dynamic where they had basically demanded um, that there would not be automation. And so the automation that has been put into docks over the last 30 years, there's basically been deals where the, the jobs don't go away. Yeah. Um, and so for every dock worker in the U.S. who actually works on the dock, dock, there's actually somebody sitting, there's a dock worker sitting at home doing nothing, still getting paid. Yeah. Right. Um, and so, and so, and, and, and this is a classic, um, um, this is a classic, uh, classic economics thing of, uh, concentrated benefits, diffuse harms, right. Which is if you're one of the 25,000 dock workers with a fake job sitting home playing, you know, playing video games, um, it, you know, that's great. Um, if you're any downstream producer or consumer in the U S economy that needs to move around, you know, goods, that's terrible because it's deadweight loss, but the, the benefits are very concentrated. The, the harms are, are diffuse, right. And individually small. And so this is, this is exactly the kind of thing that our system, has trouble dealing with, which, which, by the way, is why you get just these like completely inexplicable, apparently inexplicable politics, like hating, hating Elon, who's the guy literally who's going to save the American auto industry, hating him for not being unionized. Or, you, or another bananas example of this kind of problem is um, there are high tariffs on importation of Chinese solar panels. Um, Right, which is like we 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 want solar energy in the U.S. We want like a clean environment. Like we want to stop using fossil fuels, and yet we like basically tariff you know the 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 f out of uh, import. And, and by the way, this is like you know this is not these are politicians who normally would tell you that they're trying to save the climate, um, yeah. and, and they, they put <laughs> on uh, on every other day of the week. Yeah, on every other day of the week, but well, they still yeah, still particularly because it. it's not like there are a lot of yeah U.S. Um, solar panel companies other than I guess Elon's. Yeah, well, that's the other thing is that's that's the other business that he's in, which they also they also hate him for. So um, anyway, you can sense the theme. So um, so anyway, like these are this is like every issue. And then you've got basically uh, in the political kind of debate back and forth, you know, you have this kind of amazing political dynamic in the U.S. where historically the left, the Democrats are the party of labor. Um, and so they're the party that basically does trade barriers to protect labor. They're, you know, they're pro-union uh, and so forth and trying to support American manufacturing. And then, you know, at least historically, the American right was kind of the pro-free trade party that didn't want any of that. Um, the, the politics on that have like gone completely upside down now because Trump, you know, basically um, reoriented the Republican Party to be much more in- focused on these topics um, and to be much more pro-American labor uh, much more, much more protectionist, you know, much more pro, you know, tariff, uh, you know, put up trade barriers for strategic reasons, including protecting American industries. Um, and then, um, you know, the, you know, the Trump campaign is now making an explicit appeal to union voters, which, you know, for the first, and it's, it's uh, they had the head of the, what, the UAW, I think, speak at the RNC convention, which, which was like a c- completely unrealistic the thing. UAW or the Teamsters? I can't. I, I think it was the Teamsters. I think yeah, you're right. It was the Teamsters. Teamsters. Um, but, um, and then I think it was, was it, one of the other big unions refused to endorse a candidate this time. 
which again, again, like these, yeah. these unions have been like hardcore Democrat for like 50 years. And so, the, the, you know, the, so anyway, so the geopolitics of this are changing. And then there's this, you know, kind of question around, um, you know, kind of, uh, you know, well, it's actually funny. It's like the the right basically calls it economic nationalism. And so you want basically American, you want products basically that are bought in America to be built in America because you're trying to basically support American domestic manufacturing. Um, and then um, the, um, the, uh, the, the, um, uh, the, oh, and then the Democrat version of that is so-called industrial policy, um, right? Which is like what they're doing with the Chips Act, where they they want to deploy government money to be able to basically have the government be more involved in having domestic manufacturing and be able to you know basically you know determine its policies. Um, and so, like the, 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 this issue is kind of right at the heart of a lot of our current political debates. Um, but you know, these political debates are happening while the robot market is, I think, about to run away. Um, yeah. and so like, if these, if these issues stay as snarled as they are right now, like, I think there's a really big, <laughs> really big strategic economic national security question in front of us in robotics. Yep. It, it's actually, so, so I think it's, you know, if you think about, um, what we're concerned about in terms of our AI policy, which is really at the federal level, almost a hundred percent kind of competitiveness with China, where probably focus on entirely the wrong issue because the real issue um, competitively, particularly geopolitically, um, particularly militarily is going to be robotics and embodied yeah, AI sure. and the kind of software part and so forth is a, you know, it's a, it's nothing. It's a, it's a gnat compared to the robotics supply chain issue. And so we're entirely focused on regulating the wrong thing and encouraging the wrong thing. Yeah. And you yeah, know, we're, we're look... discouraging the thing that we're good at and we're not correct. encouraging the thing that we need to be good at. Yes, correct. In fact, I suggest we end it right there. Yes. All right. <laughs> on that happy note. <laughs> yes. Um, the good news is we are we are working on this uh, with both parties as hard as we can. So, yes, we are. And we will continue to do that. Thank you again for all the questions. We will uh, we will continue. We'll have more episodes uh, coming up where we answer more of the questions. But uh, thanks, everybody, for for, uh, for being with us. Thank you.